Ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm back to captain the vanguard. I'm here to captain my ship. I'm gonna send it to the stars. We're gonna go really far. And if they resist my occupation, then the missiles I'll let slip. Oh! We're back. I'm back um, to Captain the Vanguard. It has been like two months since I've played this game. Maybe a month. I don't know. Time's, time's flying. Life has been busy. I don't know if I remember how to play this game. I'm going to have to relearn how to play this game. This is what I recall happened last time. We went to the Endymion homeworld. And they were not helpful. I was in dire straits. I was like, please, food. You know what? Uh, some supplies, some directions, just um, some advice maybe. Can we just hang out here and fix our ship? And they just refused help. We dove to the bottom of their oceans and got eaten by fish. And then we wandered around in their deserts and stole their tulips. We almost fell into their death trap trees and almost destroyed their religious relics. But I refused to let my crew do it. If they did it without me looking, that's not my fault. But I, I didn't tell them to do it. And then I went into their holy city, and my guys got lost. Because the Endymions don't believe in street signs. They don't believe in, in, in helping strangers or, or you know, some people have a problem asking for directions. I would have asked for the directions. They wouldn't give me any advice. They wouldn't say, hey, take a left. Completely unhelpful. So I died twice there due to the unhelpfulness of the civic infrastructure of the Endymion capital. Those solitudinous pilgrims were not helpful. And it made me very upset that really the only thing that happened there was I eventually did make diplomatic contact and they agreed to help me. Um, and it just required me witnessing their, their parliament basically having a discussion and leaving again. And they were like, oh yeah, you watched us do, do parliament's reactions and left. We can help you. And I'm like, you couldn't have just showed me the way to your... <laughs> your town square where you're having a, a political debate you had to let me freeze to death in your city streets and get eaten by fish and what was the purpose of that anyway and then the game gave me the choice hey military option militarize the vanguard turn it into a warship or turn the vanguard into a giant floating embassy and i don't like this choice right last session i did pick turning it into a giant embassy, but I really regretted it the moment I made that choice. I made that choice because it felt like that was the choice the game wants me to make. If you were going out into the galaxy, even if your, your intent was absolute peace, diplomacy, negotiation, you don't just go with diplomats. You also hold a military option in reserve, right? The, 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 the USS Enterprise still has phaser banks. It still has Worf at the con. It still has quantum torpedoes and photon torpedoes. It's got a battle bridge. They only use it in like five episodes, but they have the battle bridge because sometimes the Borg show up because sometimes the Klingons get testy because sometimes the Romulans play mind games and you got to pull out the, the Batlath and show them that there's no fool around. You got to hold the military option as an option. For diplomacy to even be an option. You know what I mean? So I don't like the idea that you have got to choose between these two things. And so I, after that last session, I went through the app and I, and I changed it. I changed it so that I had chosen the military option. I chose the military option. I'm going to turn the Vanguard into a warship. And I'm going, and the, the last page of this book now is the military option. And it will let me attack planets and place military outposts upon them. I am going to refuse to use that entire mechanic unless I absolutely have to, unless the aliens prove that they are not on my side. This might screw me, but this is how I feel like I would play this game, right? This is how I would captain the ship, right? Given the option to put guns on the Vanguard after we have been attacked, I would put guns on it. Besides, besides, someone someone needs to teach these endymions how to build street signs, and if I have to do it at gunpoint, then I have to do it at gunpoint, right? Because the next person's going to come here and freeze to death and get eaten by fish, and it didn't need to happen that way, right? 
And you know, if I find the irrigators, I'm going to drop a pelican-shaped bomb on them. Because my poor crew died, and the irrigators need to be taught that lesson. And they're not going to be taught that lesson with the, with the quill of a pen. Yeah. Anyway, we go back to space. All right, we're back at the bridge. First things first. We have a brand new tech level. We're now at tech level four. Um, didn't really do anything to earn this other than talk to the Endymion's new campaign objective. I haven't read that yet. I got my Vindicator cannon installed, so our ship has got a boom boom stick. I've got three conditions or situations to deal with. Let's read my objective. Trail of the Ancients objective. And you know, you can hold me to this. Oh, and I will edit this, so I'll remember if this has something in it that I overlooked, like last time, uh, I'll, I'll get it, because it's on camera. Find information about visitors or irrigators while exploring nearby worlds. Golf Ball? A planet, a planet called Golf Ball in LCS-17. Musselheim in MU Libre. Cousin in HR-5730. Or Unger. Ugnir, Ugnir, in GJ 1164. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So, prediction time, I think, folks. Here's the thing. When we went to Matchstick, that was a planet that was constantly bursting into flames and was covered with forests. So, Matchstick. When we went to Everstorm, that was a planet that was constantly covered in storms that never ended. So, you know, Everstorm. Brimstone was a volcanic planet. The names of all these planets are kind of peculiar. It feels like that's the name the planets get after we go there, but we know the name before we go there. Like, what are the chances that, yeah, an astronomer on Earth looked through a telescope and said, that planet's called Everstorm, and it just happened to have a storm on it forever. So I think we can probably infer the conditions on these planets based on their names. So what was the first one? Golf ball. Here's what I think golf ball is. I think it is a moon. I think much like our moon, it's it's like, it's white, it's gray, it's covered with uh, millions and millions of asteroid impacts that give, put big divots, big craters all over it, making it look like a golf ball. And like a golf ball, I think it's going to have layers, right? It's probably going to have sort of a honeycombed interior, and I bet we're going to go cave spelunking, right? That's what I get from golf ball. Um, also, maybe that it is about to be hit by an asteroid, like a club, right? I think that would, like, I bet if we go to golf ball, I bet it's about to get hit by an asteroid. We land just before the asteroid picks up, and they're like, hey, you should be all in and out before it's an issue. Something's going to happen to our spaceship. We're going to get stuck on golf ball. We're going to have to go down to the caves. This is my assumption from it being called golf ball. We'll see if I'm right. What's the next planet? Muselheim. Muselheim. Well, that's Norse mythology. Niflheim was the land of the dead. Van Vanheim is where the the Vanir are from, and I think Muselheim is the dwarves. So maybe a highly industrialized alien species lives on Muselheim. Um, I'm, I'm seeing magma in my brain. I'm seeing big brass spaceships. People who don't want me to be around. Why the Norse mythology name? You know what I mean? Right? Is it as simple as there be dwarves there? Um, giant world tree, maybe? Giant tree on Muselheim? I don't know. That one's tough. I, yeah, I think highly industrialized persnickety space dwarves are going to live there. Um, if this game's got a, a, a Klingon equivalent, I would pin that on Muselheim. What's the next one? Cousin. Cousin. I suspect, I suspect maybe we go there and find humans and it's uh, like, what? <laughs> humans here? How did you get here? Uh, and we find out that the, the, the builders put um, basically the same template of humanity on two different planets under two wildly different context or situations maybe we find um oh what were they called in in the time machine there was the like trogoths or whatever they called the humanity that lived underground and then the 
the dopey prey humans that lived on the surface. You know, I think we're we're gonna go see some alternate, alternate, alternate versions of humanity. That might be a little, hmm, that might be a peculiar place to go. We'll see how they've written that. And then Ugner, U G N I R, Ugner. I don't know what that's a reference to. I'm gonna Google it. Okay, so I've just Googled the the word Ugner and nothing came up. It doesn't seem to be something in a different language. It doesn't seem to be, it's a unique, it's a unique word, which is unique in the name of all these planets, right? Brimstone, Matchstick, Everstorm, Golf Ball, Muselheim, Ugner. So I'm thinking that's definitely an alien name, the alien's name for it. That's my best bet for a planet that has people on it. Ugner. What is the sound Ugner make me feel like then? Ugner. It sounds like hitting something with a club. Ugner. It sounds like shooting a gun. Ugner. What kind of a throat would make the sound Ugner? U G. I N R. It doesn't. You. It's not a real slick way to pronounce it. Eugen. Eugener. You. Eugener. A non-human mouth says this word. Or one that has a very peculiar way of pronouncing things. Eugener. It's very guttural. Is it throaty? Eugener is a word you don't need to open your mouth for. You know what I mean? So maybe that planet is cold right? You protect your teeth and you try not to take deep breaths and put the cold back into you, right? Maybe um, it's hard. The people there are going to be hard, probably very aggressive, probably against outsiders. This is my theory. I think if, if there's a place that's going to immediately flash into violence, it's Ugner. If there's a place where there's going to be the opportunity to get the best technology. It's going to be Muselheim. I think we're going to get trapped on golf ball. And Cousin is going to be some weird, weird biological moral dilemma where we bump into a, 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 a weird, twisted version of humanity. Um, prediction time's over. Let's continue. Okay, I've got these three situations to deal with. Let's see what they are. Claustrophobia. I know what this one is. Low morale and shuffle this card into possible situations. That puts me from medium morale down to low morale. Food shortage. Lower morale and move this card to the awaiting envelope or lose two power and move this card to the awaiting envelope. Okay, well, we have the power, so we're going to do that. Move it to waiting. Discard two power. And unfinished business. Lower morale and shuffle this card into possible situations. So we're back to very low morale again. Wow. I've got to draw a bunch of situations. Let's see. I've got to draw. I've got to draw three situations for my objective. An additional situation situation because I'm very low morale. That's going to be four situations. Here's my four situations. Provocation. A group of dissenting crew members tries to stir up trouble in order to blame the captain and his section leaders. Claustrophobia again. Madness creeps into people's minds when they are confined to narrow corridors of the spaceship for too long. I've drawn this like every single time. It's, come on. Tensions. Small scale squirrels boil over into hatred. Heated online discussions. Heated online discussions? So they're not even getting angry at each other to their each other's faces. They're sending each other like sassy texts they're so claustrophobic they won't even talk to each other face to face and they're, they're getting into flame wars and finally pro-alien protest protesters not everyone agrees with the section leader's decision to turn the vanguard into a warship protests and heated discussions echo through the ship shut up i'm the one i'm the captain here and i get to decide i get to decide now you protesters okay this is the solar system i'm in I've been uh, I've been running around on Galice thirty six eight dash two, uh, the Endymion Cabal. Uh, it's been rough here. Let's see where can I go from here. I don't, I'm not going to hang around here again. I was talking uh, on the Discord, the Room and Board Discord, 
to some people who informed me that uh, that there's this handy star map on the back of um, the logbook. And I haven't been using the logbook because I've been using the uh, audio logs, the app. So I didn't even know the star map was there. So we can do some planning from here. I'm down here and we can go to LC-17. This gives me a lot less information than I thought it was going to give me. It doesn't give me the name of the planets. Uh, one second, let me go check my objective and see what that says. I'm most interested in Ugnir. So Ugnir is in GJ-1164. So if we look for GJ-1164, that's right here. And in order to get there, we have to leave from LCS 17. And we're in Galice. So I think we're going to jump from Galice to LCS 17. And from there, we're going to go to GL 1164. And we're going to go see, see what's going up with Ugner. Uh, taking out my ship thing. Ooh. Okay. A white dwarf in the middle of this star system is very faint providing local planets with the bare minimum of energy. It's dark, it's spooky. Ah, there's Golf Ball. We can land on Golf Ball. It's one of our objective planets. The planet resembles a rocky golf ball. I'm a genius. With ice nestled in its craters, two of the pits are possible sources of the builder's signal. It also looks like a good place to replenish our water supplies. Neat. What else is here? S stroke LCS 17A1. We may extract more water from this ice moon, but something down there really spooks the crew. The Comet Lapitus. Ooh. I wonder if the Comet Lapitus is going to land on Golf Ball after we get there. LCS 17. A graveyard for strayed explorers. What could have beckoned them here? Okay. What does this mean? A graveyard for strayed explorers. Right? Did we appear in this solar system and get a little message being like, this is a graveyard for strayed explorers. Have we seen a bunch of crashed ships? Right? Is that why we think it's a graveyard? Like, are there a bunch of ships floating around? And what makes us think it's a graveyard, not just a bunch of ships parked? Right? Or is it a bunch of bodies? And in which case, space is massive and we just entered the solar system. How do we know that there are enough bodies clustered in one part of space to make it a graveyard? Right? Is this a planet? LCS-17? Resting place? It's not even a planet. It's just sort of pointing at this asteroid field, right? And if you did drop a bunch of bodies there, over like millions of years they would drift apart. So if there is a cluster of bodies floating around in space, that means that it happened recently. <laughs> right? This doesn't make any sense. Right? What does it mean that a graveyard of straight explorers? Give me a better explanation than that game. Anyway, we're not staying here. We wanted to go to JG1164. There we go. Page 17. It's only going to cost us one power to go there. Oh. Lots of very blue systems going on here. What's it say? This system is frequented by the Edimians and many unknown races we know nothing about. We should never forget that we aren't alone in the galaxy. What's in the solar system? These, um... These two suns are orbiting each other. It looks like very quickly, right? This is like a pulsar. Uh, and then an Endymion vessel. Okay, well, we know the Endymions and we don't like them. We don't hate them either. But they're hanging out here. I wonder why. Why do they come here? We know they're pilgrims, religious pilgrims. An Endymion vessel, a tiny spaceship bearing Endymion symbols, drifts through space. It emits invitation for contact. Hmm, so we could go talk to them. Uh, what am I interested in? I'm interested in Ugner. What's it say about that? The planet is gray without any distinctive features. However, our scans determine that some life is present here. Return any landing... Okay. Well, we're going to land there. But we might as well uh, explore the other things in the solar system first. So I'm going to go to the Endymion vessel because it's free. And I'm going to go check out the asteroid belt that resembles the spine of a giant creature... I don't like whatever scientist is informing the bridge about what the scanners are telling them in this system. I don't like it, right? They're taking too much creative freedom, right? When the captain arrives in the solar system, I want to know it's here. I don't want the, some guy at the sensors to be like, that asteroid belt looks like the spine of a giant creature. Oh, I, I think that's the graveyard of an alien species. Stop making inferences and just tell me what literally is there. What makes this asteroid belt a place worth going to? <laughs> And it's not that it looks like the spine of a creature. All right. Uh, I'm going to go look at some logs now. 
Oh. I'm even more upset at the Endymions now. Went to that Endymion spaceship, sent one of my crew inside. We brought the artificial intelligence that we had built on the Endymion planet so that we could talk to them. And my, my crew member turns on the artificial intelligence that lets translate so we let we, we can talk to each other. People died <laughs> building that translator. And the Endymion said, no, 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 turn it off, turn it off. I don't like artificial intelligence. And we're like, okay. Turned it off. And then he said, I have a device. And if we turn it on, we will just perfectly understand each other's perspectives psychically. And my crew member just sat there and the Endymion just sat there and perfectly understood each other's positions and, and traded thoughts about philosophy and politics and religion and science and then left enlightened. I wandered around on the Endymion homeworld for days, people froze to death in their streets that they didn't bother to mark with street signs and the entire, and just to build a way to communicate with these people, to ask for help. And they, the whole time, they had a device that just allowed two people to completely understand each other psychically. They could have pressed a button, understood our perspective and either helped or not helped at that point. But no, they made us wander around in the desert. <laughs> they watched us dive to the bottom of the ocean and almost get eaten by fish. And the whole time they were sitting there with a button that let us perfectly understand their perspective and them perfectly understand our needs and our perspective. And the whole time they didn't press the button. These people deserve to be bombed. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to bomb them. I'm not going to be mean. The Endymions are whatever. I've survived. But they are aggravating, man. They could have solved the entire, the last, I played like five, four, three missions on that planet, landed three different times, but that was hours and hours of playing. That was people dying, that was making stressful decisions and the entire time the Endymions could have short-circuited this entire situation. That, they walked up to me, the gall of the Endymions. They walked up to me when I first landed on their planet with a platter. And that platter had a bunch of stuff. It had like smoking incense, a pile of salt. It had some stones. It had some polished rocks. It had half a mask. And they were like, here's a platter of stuff. They could have pressed a button on their wrist and perfectly understood. And we would have perfectly understood what to do with the platter of stuff, right? And they would have perfectly understood our perspective of what that platter of stuff meant. But instead, they just handed it to us like a riddle. And when we didn't do exactly what they wanted, they got angry with us. Like, what was their deal? They could have just... What? Why? Why did they do that? I... Mm. You see, I think this is a situation where there, there's a team that's writing the narrative for this game. And then there's a team that's writing, like, the, the flavor text. And they're not communicating very well. Anyway, I have some electricity that gave me power. I'm back up to four power. So I can pretty much explore most of the stuff on this planet or on this solar system before landing on the planet. And we're going to do that. Oh, I'm really not liking the Endymions. Um, so we arrived, we're, we're checking out one of these planets in the solar system. And my science officer turns to me and is like, it looks like this planet we're looking at right now has had the crystal doomsday device implanted in it that has been planted in a number of different planets that we've run into so far um, on our journey. And all of those planets have been at a different state of, of the apocalyptic doomsday destruction. Um, and like at first the crystal gets planted in the planet, and nothing happens. And then it cools the planet's core. And then it starts growing enormous crystals that rip apart the, the, the planet's crust and, and basically blast off its atmosphere and cause it to cool down and uh, allow it to get irradiated by the sun and kills everything uh, and destroys the planet and turns it into like a giant spiky crystal in space basically, right? The, it's a doomsday device. And so we saw, see this planet, my science officer is like, hey, it looks like this is in the mid stages of the, of, of the crystal doomsday, right? We, the crystals haven't started to tear apart the continents yet, but pretty much all life has been blasted from its surface because the atmosphere is gone. And the Endymion ambassador that's come onto our ship was like, ah, uh, yeah, no, this is the same doomsday device that who has been planted on and enlists all the other planets we've seen that had this crystal planted on them. And 
some other character in the log is like, hey, wait, you knew that the, the, all these planets had doomsday devices on them and that the civilizations on them were all going to die? Did you do anything? And the Endymion's like, it's not my place to help other people see how we see the world. So not only did the Endymion's let my people freeze to death in their city, not only did they not use their universal psychic translator to perfectly understand each other, they also just let countless other civilizations get killed by this crystal doomsday device. Knowing that it was happening and knowing that they could have done something to either stop it or save the people there. The Endymions suck. <laughs> They're just rotten to the core. Like, so much for being a completely decentralized society. It's like they're all libertarians, right? They refuse to help anyone else. And they're all in it for their own private gratification. And even if the universe crumbles around them, they will still be sitting on their little island drinking margaritas. Look at how frustrating this is, right? And I understand this is how the game is, is telling us this story, right? Because we don't have... If this was a science fiction television show or if this was a book, right, there would just be there would be chapters, there'd be episodes where crew members talk to the Endymion ambassador and got information and find out sort of how they see the world. But because this is a board game and we're only getting the Endymion perspective through these logs and these logs only happen when we go to locations, we're getting all this information too late. The fire alarm would go off. And the Endymion ambassador would be like, Ah, yes, your kitchen was on fire when I left it four hours ago. And we'd run down to the kitchen it had been on fire for four hours and everything you own is on and burned down. And you'd be like, why didn't you tell me before Endymion? And the Endymion would be like, well, you didn't activate the log until five minutes ago. And I only speak when you activate logs. But the, the impression it's leaving me with is that the Endymions suck. Uh, <laughs> they aren't evil. They just suck. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to give them the solitude that they desire by never interacting with them willingly again. It's time to land on Ugner. The Ugner landing card. I spent everything. I'm looking at all of the information on the card. We might be looking at another explode as we go down to the planet situation. Mission type. Apart from its single interesting biosignature, the planet is barren and mineral poor. Full ground exploration is unlikely. The lander, lander mods, and equipment will not have any effect on this mission. Hmm. Confrontation with an aggressive threat is possible. What does that mean? Something this game is struggling with is, is the context of the information that it's giving you, right? You go to the star map and you look at the information for all the locations of interest in the solar system. And instead of that information being like, okay, here's a planet that has lots of minerals on it. Here is a... Here's an asteroid belt. It says, here is a, a bunch of rocks that look like the spine of a monster. That is likely the graveyard of an alien species. And I'm like, what does that mean? This is not helpful information, right? It's flavor text, right? In the context of it being the information I'm being given by the crew of my ship to make decisions, it's not useful. This card is giving me information from scanning the planet. And it says, confrontation with aggressive threat is possible? What does that mean? Like, I, I told my crew member to scan the planet, and they turned back to me and said, Captain, confrontation with an aggressive threat is possible. And I turned back to them, and I said, that's not a report, Anson. What do you mean? <laughs> of course, there's a, a confrontation with an aggressive threat is possible literally everywhere. What does that mean? Right? Did you scan giant buffalo on this planet? Right? Is there giant sandworms down here? Are there a bunch of people with guns that you're looking at with your 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 telescopic lenses on your scanning equipment? What does it mean that confrontation with a threat is possible? Right? Right? If this was actually like this isn't useful <laughs> information, and it's aggravating information in the context of the story. Right? And like someone, whoever was in charge of making this mission is trying to hold their cards very close to their chest to make something surprising happen. And they even had the gall to hide this behind something that costs two energy. Like they're hoping you get to the solar system and don't have the energy to look at this. And if you did, it gives you no information anyway. It's kind of dumb, right? So he told me there's not going to be a landing uh, or like a planetary exploration. So what are we even doing here? Like this does not give me any information. Physic, are there rocks ahead? If there are, we all be dead. Great, great. You've given me great navigational assistance, Fezzik. 
Captain, maybe there's something dangerous on this planet. Great information, John. Get back to me when you have anything useful to impart. There's something interesting down there, I'm sure. Great information, John. Uh, do you have anything else to say about the planet? It's a planet, sir! So John isn't very helpful. The scanner isn't very helpful. The flavor text is kind of useless. Let's go to this planet. I'm going to the war room. I've got three of these tokens to spend to do stuff. I'm gonna spend the first one to go to the war room for the first time. I might not do anything here, I don't know, but I wanna see what this, this room is all about. So let's find out. You may choose to send armed forces to another planet. To do so, choose a target planet on the next page. You must then remove from the game available crew members to meet the rank requirements depicted on this card. These crew members are now stationed on the planet. All right, yeah, we'll, we'll send someone to Iota Pegasi. It just takes a rookie. We'll send someone I don't like. I'm gonna get rid of you, Lon Pong. Not because I don't like you. I do like you. You're just sort of not looking at the camera and it makes you feel a little bit more like, ex dis like disposable. And I'm sorry about that, but that's the truth. Sending you to Iota Pegasi. Iota Pegasi, our military base allowed us to map this region of space, thus making our travels easier. Place two power in the token bag. That's not super impressive. I don't need two extra power because I'm already generating six every round. I'm probably not going to waste any more command tokens going to the war room. Uh, <laughs> like, that's a waste, right? And all it got me was some energy? Pfft. Anyway, I, uh, I also went to the production facility. Um, I just sort of lightly progressed my progress on constructing things, building some weapons for the ship to attach them to the hull. Um, that's exciting. Uh, I went to the situation room. I managed most of my situations. We still have a food shortage, so that's going to be an issue. Um, but you solve it with uh, power, and I've got lots of more power than I know what to do with. So that's going to be fine. Now i got to land on this planet. This thing has told me, hey, there's going to be a dangerous thing there, maybe. And also, uh, lander mods, your lander, and, and all that stuff doesn't matter. Is this a situation where I'm going to enter in that log and it's going to say... You scan it from space, everything's fine, you move on. Or is it going to be everyone you put in the lander explodes? Again, I've been there. If it right, if it does turn into a landing thing and I just put like two people in the lander, I'm gonna get screwed. So I might as well put four, but it says there's probably not going to be a landing. Right? Like this literally hasn't given me any information that's like it should say like, hey, this is not a landing. Do not pick a lander or landing mods or, or crew for it. Go to this log. That's not what it's done. Which is just let me say, hey, half of the stuff that you pick when you go to landing um, don't count. But does that mean that the other half is still important? Right? It says, hey, there's full ground exploration is unlikely. Does that mean partial ground exploration is likely? And in that case, do I need a full away team? Right? And usually they can have a chance to explode on the way down. But it says, hey... Lander and lander mods and equipment won't have any effect. So what does this mean, right? Is it wise to send just two crew down? Because I can just send two crew down on the off chance they get swallowed by a giant space butterfly or something. Or do I put four crew in there because I might need four crew? This, this stupid scanning card is not very helpful. I'm going to take, I'm going to risk it for the biscuit. I'm going to assume that it's better to have four people than to have no people. So I'm sending young Corky Zack, Samus Aurelian, Vadaz, and my psychopath Bridget. And we'll see what we see. Battle stations! Battle stations! We're going back to battle stations again! <laughs> this time I'm being invaded not by robots, um, but slugs, big slugs. Let me show you the big slug. A crab? Look at this monstrous thing. Look at this terrible thing. Look at this, look at this creepy Magnus Sareb. You're wondering, hey, Zach, what is that thing? I'm back defending the Vanguard from invasion again. Uh, just my luck, the, uh, the planet that I've won to starts an invasion of my ship. Uh, this horrible brain uh, eating psychic slug beast um, mind controlled my crew on the planet, somehow found its way up into space onto my ship when my crew uh, ran away, 
probably uh, hijacked uh, a ride on the outside of my shuttle, uh, has gotten into my ship. It is mind controlled, all the crew who are crawling around on the floor as if they were maggots. They all think they're worms. They're all doing their best impression of, of Hades' sidekicks from the Hercules movie. We are worms! Worthless worms! And only my away team is not being mind controlled now because the crew of the Vanguard noticed that they were being mind controlled on the planet. And when they came up here, they went through decontamination and got jammed full of anti-psychotropics so that they, to help them after they were mind controlled by a bug. But because of that, they're the only ones who are conscious uh, and able to do anything. There are maybe many, many giant slug beasts on the Vanguard. They're eating the crew as they crawl around on the floor, thinking that they're worms. We defend the ship. I defend this ship. We're sort of replaying the same shtick, right? Um, it would be neat if these psychic bugs presented some sort of existential psychological threat, inveigling minds, right? If the threat was the, the, the mission of the Vanguard being perverted by this slug mission, slug alien dallying in everyone's brains. But no, the, the threat is that it eats people in their sleep again, so we go and we save them again. Another thing, when I was on the planet and I was being mind controlled by this bug, I had the option. I could have fired the ship's Vindicator cannon and b destroyed the bugs on the surface from orbit. I should have nuked them from orbit. The reason I didn't was because the game has told me that the Vindicator cannon can punch a hole the size of a city through a moon. Right. This is not. This is not a little little gun. This is a. We're gonna blow a hole, like a many miles wide hole, through a moon, and through a moon tells me like like in out one side out the other, a through shot, which sounds like an absurd amount of power to shoot at a slug on the surface of a planet, especially a slug that is close enough to my crew that they can see it. Right. I mean, they gave they gave the Vanguard a Death Star cannon, but I don't just have a a shoot slug on surface of planet cannon, right? Uh, I wish I wish the game was clear to me about which one of those what purposes like did the game give me the option to fire the Vindicator cannon because that is a possible solution if you've built the Vindicator cannon, or is it telling you you can fire the Vindicator cannon because my people were being mind controlled and they were making a stupid choice? I can't, I don't know. I have no information making these choices. And it bugs me a lot, right? It's becoming a theme. The more I play this game, the more it's becoming an issue. But anyway, let's, 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 let's crush this crustacean and let's defend this ship. You know what? Another reason to dislike the Endymions. When we arrived at this planet, the Endymion was like, oh, you've come to this planet, eh? Well, you're not going to find out anything down there. We've come here many, many times. And we were like, hey, what do you mean? Like, what are we going to find down there? Can you explain yourself? And then Damien was just like, if you got to see, you got to see, I guess. And we're like, we don't have to see. You could just tell us what we're about to find. We're coming here because this is one of the, the planets that the builders built stuff on. If you want to tell us what was built here, we don't need to. And he's like, oh, if you got to see, I got to see, I guess. And what he, I guess he knew, he knew that these mind control bugs were here and that they were going to destroy our away team and climb onto our ship and mind control everyone. And he's being mind control and probably being eaten right now. And you know what? He could have stopped it all by talking to us. He could have stopped it all by turning on the machine we just got from that other endymion that lets us read each other's minds. We could have turned on that machine. Why didn't we turn on that machine? I don't... Mm. This was so avoidable. This was so avoidable. And, like, we didn't get the option to turn on that machine. We didn't get get the option to, like, okay, instead of sending an away team, we'll we'll talk about this to the guy who already knows what's on this planet. Right? Where, where's that? This. The scanner. I already complained about this scanner. But confrontation with an aggressive threat is possible. Couldn't have said, oh... Mind control bugs down there and literally nothing else because the planet was barren. The, barren. the planet had mushrooms on it and these big mind control slugs and that was it. That's the entire planet. Couldn't have said that on the scan? <laughs> 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 I 
I'm bugged. I'm bu oh, I'm bugged. The bug is in my brain, but also I'm bugged. This mm, bugging me, bugging me. But I'm gonna defend the ship. I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky that I brought four crew. If I had only brought two crew like I was going to, I would be screwed right now. I think I'm gonna lose. I think I'm gonna lose. This um, this Magnus Serum, this guy is trying to crawl towards uh, space six, sector six on the on the ship. The sector six is right here, and he's crawled from here to here to here. And my, my grand scheme was I was gonna get my crew into this spot and shut the doors and be ready to fight him here. I've spent everybody's action though to get these three people here, and I forgot that the events were going to move him. So I've gotten there, I've reached the spot, but none of these guys have actions to stop him. I can move her two spaces, one, two, and I can get there, but that's all of her actions. So she's just gonna stand there and watch as he crawls into spot six, and there's nothing I can do about it. And I can't stop him. I think I've lost, he's gonna get here. And I'm gonna read a log and I think I lose this planet here. I don't know how I would have succeeded in this. I can't stop it. Move a dice in order to move into that spot. And she's got to roll two dice to get into the spot with the Magnus Cerub. And now it's in the spot with the Magnus Cerub. Now we draw an event card. And if the event card does not have the icon I'm hoping it has, then the time tracks move and the Magnus Cerub achieves its objective. And I lose the game. And that's going to happen. The Magnus Cerub moves into spot six. It's in spot six. I'm going to go read a log and it's going to tell me that the Magnus Cerub's eaten everyone to death. I misplayed this somehow. We're not dead yet. We're not dead yet. So the game said it crawled into the med bay and started murdering people um, left, right, and center. Blood flying everywhere. It's horrific. And then it said we managed to activate the defense system in the med bay, uh, which, which scared it out of the med bay and it crawled back into spot two of the board. Um, but the defense systems in the med bay are all out. If it gets in there again, there's no stopping it. It made me roll a bunch of psychic danger dice as it ran past me. Um, I have no supplies left. Everyone just panicked, ate all my supplies. I can't refresh people's pools. The crab Magnus Sarah is, the not crab is, we're only two rounds into this, right? All my guys have taken a single turn and I think I might already lose. I might already lose. Okay, everyone's in this spot. The Magnus Sarab, the Nut Crab is here. It's trying to get here. So it's gonna go boop, boop in order to get there. I can use this card to lock doors. So that's what I'm gonna do with everybody's turn. We're gonna put a bunch of locks on this door so the Magnus Sarab can't get through. It's gonna walk into our spot and then we, we beat it with sticks until Shit. Okay, we go. We go. We go. We fight. This is, um, the knot crab must fall. So I'm starting with, uh, young Zachary, um, who is my recon. He is the last living Zachary in my ship, besides myself. All my other clones have bit the bullet, I think. One of them might be in the med bay. Cool. So in order to lock a door, I need to roll two greens and two reds or a computer and exploration. He can't do that alone. And he has to roll an eye danger dice as well. So eye danger dice. He's going to roll two greens and one red. And he's going to be assisted by someone with a green. who will be assisted by Andrea Agata, who will also roll that one later. Let's start with Zach's dice. A red. A blank on the danger. That's good. Uh... One of those, that's not so good. And one of those. Okay, Andrade's gonna roll. Cool. Why'd I roll three greens? Why'd I roll three greens? I needed two greens and two reds. I've rolled the wrong dice. I've rolled the wrong dice. These do nothing. These do nothing. These do nothing. Those do nothing. <laughs> oh, I gotta play it like a lies. I. <laughs> 
I can't help it. This is clone of me. <laughs> Young quirky Jack Zach had one job being to shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrea got it, just had to help him by rolling one red dice. <laughs> Didn't matter what was on those dice, they just needed to roll them. <laughs> they failed. <laughs> I failed. <laughs> I rolled the wrong dice. The slug is going to get, well, let's find out what happens. Um, the slug monster has not moved because I drew this event card. Um, the slug monster is not going to move. Instead, there was a deadly trap, which made Zach roll one of these things and he got injured. <clears throat> so the slug is still here. I still have a chance to lock this door. Next up is Vidaz. Um, Vidaz does not have the dice necessary to lock the security door, even though he's an engineer. Um, unless I use my last supply to refresh his dice pool. And then roll two greens, two reds, and both of these injury dice. Let's hope he locks the door. First things first. That's two greens, that's two reds, which means that this door is locked and no one can go through it, including the slug beast. I've misinterpreted a thing. So this says you've got to roll two green and two red or a computer and an exploration. This You get to lock the door if you succeed. But if you don't succeed, you progress all time tracks. I didn't succeed when Zach did it. So all time tracks would have progressed. The creature would be in this spot and they all would have gotten brain attacked anyway. Um, I'm gonna have to roll a bunch of dice. Oh my god. Oh my god, it's going bad. <sighs> Young Quirky Zack is critically wounded, wounded and panicked. Vadaz is wounded, wounded and panicked. Bridget and Agata are fine. But, whoa, things are bad. Um, Vadaz and Zack are almost dead. <clears throat> the brain bug is in my space. I have to roll or draw another one of these. It's... Time tracks progress. Okay. The bug's back in sector one. That removes... Oh my god, alright. I didn't need to lock the door. I didn't need to lock the door. Um, no, it's good that I locked the door. Um, but it's the door has now become unlocked. I can wait. Let's see. Where The bug is going to first going to crawl into spot two. Then into seven. Then into six. Two, seven, and six. I'm in spot seven. I can try to lock the door. Okay, so... Bridget's going next. Bridget does not have a dice to lock the door. If she rolls all the dice she owns, no one can help her to lock the door. She's not locking the door. What do we need to even fight the bug? A computer, a genetics, and a strength? Or two blue and two red? My guys are not built for this. The bug's gonna beat them. Um, she's talking genetics and strength. She doesn't have the computers. You have computers, so you do have to fight her, him. Okay, exactly. I don't have to fight them. Computers exploration can open the door. He rolls that. She doesn't have exploration, though. We can't refresh. We're gonna have to exhaust. Oh my god. I don't know. Alright, I'm not explaining this well to you guys. Things are bad. Let's just summarize it like that. Um, the, the, the brain bug has an ability that burn, that forces you to sacrifice dice, to burn dice. And I was a little willy nilly with it at the beginning of this game because I was like, it's just one brain bug, we're gonna fight it. Um, I think I've discarded, so I've sacrificed some of the wrong dice. I didn't realize how often it would make me sacrifice those dice. I didn't realize also that people were gonna panic and eat all of their energy bars, ruining all of my supplies. With no supplies, I can't refresh their dice without sacrificing more dice. I can only sacrifice so many dice. People are already almost dead. And the people that are almost dead, Vidaz and Zack, are the ones that are most important for fighting this bug. They need to ha be around to use their dice to help this thing happen. If I'm lucky, I have three rounds before the bug is back in my space. Oh, but it's going to be so bad. Okay, we're back to uh, Bridget's turn. Ooh, no, but the monster's in her space. She is going to attack it. So she's going to roll that. And Vidaz is going to help with that. And that's all we can hope for. Okay. And Vidaz's help. Okay. Doesn't matter really what they say. 
So that's going to put one marker on the monster. Bam. Okay, we need four markers on the monster to actually beat it. Uh, so when we roll two blue and two red, crawl, then place a marker on this card. Oh, sh shrunk. It crawls into the highest numbered space. It leaves seven, and it goes into six. I go back to this log entry, I guess. 893. I didn't defend the ship. I didn't defend the ship. It got into the medical bay, and it just ate until it couldn't eat anymore, and then the, the log said eventually some crew came to their senses and killed it. It was in control of the ship for hours. It ate for hours. The crew that were going crazy and thought they were worms destroyed large sections of the ship. The knot crab destroyed large sections of the ship before it died. It killed some of my crew. Then it said I was to open up my resting crew, so the crew that I didn't send on this mission, and to randomly select one crew from each section Remove them from their rank sleeves, I think because they've just been killed. They've been ki they've been eaten alive in their sleep. Willow Baker has been eaten to death by a crab while she slept in the torpor chamber. Jesse Bennett, eaten in the med bay. Um, hopefully she didn't come to her senses before it was finished eating her, because that would have been horrifying. My space wizard. Willow Baker and my space wizard defended the ship from a robot menace and they were eaten to death while they thought they were tube grubs because a giant snail got onto my ship. Jesse Bennett was going to be the, the anime protagonist. She's going to take off her glasses and say something really c cool and reveal her Sharon gun and take out, like... W w <sighs> the last thing the log said was that the only thing coming to this planet has left us with was the promise of months and months of repair and recuperation. Um, what crew were not killed by this slug have apparently gone mad and need need psychological treatment and medical treatment. I don't blame them. They all thought they were worms for hours as, as they were being picked off. And the, the way team that I sent to protect them was killed. Speaking of killed, young, young quirky Zack is gone. Kaput. These people are dead. God damn it. She was my favorite. I should... Of all the way... I was fine. If she goes on an away team mission and is reckless and, and isn't able to save everybody and, and dies heroically. But no. A slug crawled into her quarters and just bit her head off. Because my other away team <laughs> messed up. I'm screwed. I'm screwed. My... Who do I have left? <laughs> the only crew member I have left and resting crew is Terry Isaac. Terry Isaac and what's left of this away team. I'm going to go and do the cleanup phase and... Why? <laughs> oh, man. I'm, I'm not prepared for this. We're about to lose the game. I'm about to, I think I'm about to lose the game. Um, I thought it would be more climactic. I thought there, I didn't, I didn't expect just a bug to get on my ship and ruin me and 
all my best crew unable to do anything about it for 45 minutes. Docking, if the mission was a failure, it was a failure. The mission is a failure if you still have the mission uh, objective card on the board. It was. Um, mission failure. Step one, lower morale. So we'll go to the front of the book to lower morale. I'm already at very low morale. If any effect causes you to low mor lower morale while you're at very low morale, instead of applying any other penalties, each section player must choose one section die from their section component and return it to the box. Each section immediately removes one of their available or resting crew members from their rank sleeves and removes it from the game. These crew members have abandoned their section and are not placed on the memorial wall. So let's go through it. Each section has to go through the available crew. I'll go through the available crew. It's one guy. This is my available crew. It's Terry. <laughs> it's Terry Isaac. Um, he <laughs> looks at the tragedy that has just occurred. He was against this whole militarization thing. Right? He was here on a mission of science, not a military. He was upset when I sent those two guys to go and take over that planet, even though there was no one there. And then he was also upset when I led all of my crew to uh, a planet that had nothing on it and where everyone got almost eaten by a slug and then let the slug under the ship and then had that slug eat almost everybody, he's not happy and he's going to quit. He's not going to follow me no more. He's out. If any section has no available or resting crew members left, the campaign ends in failure. Well, Terry Isaac's gone. He's quit. I have no more available or resting crew members. And I have no... It's campaign failure. I'll finish going through all these steps. Discard the mission failed token from the planet board. If there are any mission cards left on the planet board, return to the mission tray. I already did that. Discard excess discoveries. I did. Assemble available crew members. Each player takes all crew members from resting crew. There are none. Place them in their hand. Leave crew members on crew boards where they are now. Players who control more than one section keep their available crew members together. Gotcha. Debriefing. Promote crew members. I have no experience. I can't promote anyone. Create the success pool. I have no successes because that was just a failure. Just a cascading failure. Buy or sell dice. I can't. Unloading of the ship. Uh, I skipped this step because I didn't have it. Um, I do get to look at the log for the cerebral cortex. Maybe that's going to save me. I listened to the log. Um, we, we ripped the brain out of that slug creature that we killed. And we, we did some science on it. It seems that the creature has no reproductive organs. It's basically a giant brain on little skittery legs. And they found out that the way it got onto the ship was the big, big slug knot crab on the planet that we fought it used telepathy to reorganize the matter um, in our in our sort of big vats of like food and reorganize the, the matter there to create a stem cell which grew into one of these creatures. These creatures reproduce telepathically and they, they spread from planet to planet by telepathically reorganizing matter on like comets or, or passing spaceships to create these things. Um, and that's how they spread around the galaxy. Yeah, cool, neat science fiction-y concept. Doesn't change the fact that I think I've lost the game. I'm at the Med Bay. Terra of Zogby has come out of the Med Bay. So, you know, he goes to resting crew. Uh, I just rolled the dice. Vadaz, he dies from his injuries. Bridget has one injury. She goes to the med bay. I'm already dead. Agata also goes to the med bay. That is that. This leaves me in a situation. So right now, Tariff Zogby is alive. He just came out of the med bay. Everyone who was on that mission either died or is locked in the med bay. This is my only crew member. Now, 
the Deadly Space rules say, if any section has no available crew or resting crew members left, the campaign ends in failure. When do I count this? Because I lost the morale on the undocking phase. And at that point in time, I had three crew on my crew boards, but no crew in my resting or available crew because they were all dead or quit. So at that point, I had no resting or available crew, would have ended in failure. Next step was undocking. I skipped that, or uh, unloading, because I had nothing to load. Um, next step was unique discoveries. That was the research into the brain. Next step was the med bay, which put everybody into the med bay and killed the Daz, or he succumbed to his injuries, his wounded and his double panicked injuries. And then Terra Zogby came out of the med bay and went into resting crew. So at this point in time, I haven't failed the game, but for a period of like three phases of the game, I had lost. There was no one in resting or available crew. Do I count this as a loss or do I continue with my one remaining crew member? No, oh, I have lost. Here's the situation, like I have lost. There was, a, there was a point in this game I lost. Technically, absolutely, I had no crew in resting or available crew. And it's a little weird because Usually you're supposed to lower morale and stuff at the bridge phase, which is the first phase of the game. But because I was lowering morale for failing the mission, that happens at a weird point in time in the game. So I still had crew on my crew boards at that time, but they weren't in resting or available. And you've got you've to hold yourself to the letter of the rules. I think this is a loss. This is a loss. I've got Terev Zogby climbs out of the med bay onto the bridge and finds all the other crew quit or eaten or in shock in the medical bay, he takes over. He is now the captain of the Vanguard. What happens to this ship now is up to him because he's the only one left. Um, I'm not going to tell that story because I'm not Terra of Zogby, right? This horrible mass murderer, this, um, this guy who's tattooed himself um, from killing all those people. This guy who pretended to be a tech mogul. Um, <laughs> right? If you remember, um, back of this guy's card says he's a tech mogul who made a bunch of million dollar companies and then gave them away for free. Um, but if you look at him, it's kind of a horrifying tattooed prison man. Um, and like, I know I'm making like a snap judgment based on his appearance. Uh, and I think... I think the description on the back of his card is trying to describe a person who is not what you would expect and get you to like think about, you know, think about the assumptions you make about people. But this guy is definitely a horrible criminal who faked on his application that he is a tech mobile mogul. And he is the captain of the Vanguard now because he's the only one left. And I'm no longer the captain. I, I have been, I quit. I quit. And I go and I sit in the brig. <sighs> And, and Terry Isaac comes to visit me and explains in excruciating detail the ways that I screwed up. The, the game ends. I lose. The end. The voyage of the Vanguard as commanded by Zachary right here, right now. Was it because I delved too greedily and too deep into space? No. I was curious about a planet called Ugnir. And I thought, that's the only planet that I can't make a solid prediction for. Let's let's beeline it there and see what happens. And it just so happens to be telekinetic slugs that inveigled our ship and ruined my voyage. And my last, my last quote, let's go to the memorial wall. We gather here today to say goodbye to a, a bunch of really brave brave astronauts who gave their life in the pursuit of, of, of science. Um, many of them made mistakes, but we all make mistakes from time to time. Vidaz Capaloni came to space not for altruistic reasons, not because he was the best man for the job, not because he dreamed of space, not because anyone asked him to come. The fact is he was broke and in debt, and he had no options. And he came to space just to, to keep himself alive, to keep his family alive, to keep himself out of prison, 
He was just doing what all people do, trying to get by. And he came to space. He went to the edge, edge of, of, of human understanding in order to pay his rent. And, and I think that's honorable. I think it's tragic that we live in a world where he had to go to such extents. This, this normal, good working, hard, hard bitten guy, how did he end up going out? Did he give, go out giving his life for now with another person? No. No, he went down to a planet and got mind controlled and thought he was a worm. And he crawled around a little bit and hurt himself. And then when he got up to the, the ship and we gave him the best medical treatment we could, um, it was only minutes later that a, a brain bug, an, an insect, a knot crab, crawled into his mind and, and made him panic so much that he had a heart attack and died. Did he deserve it? No. No, and it wasn't his fault that it happened to him. It was his captain that led him astray. We say goodbye to Vadaz, and no apology is enough. Willow Baker. Many people on this cruise said they were always following her, and she was always, she was always telling them to follow her, to trust her, and she never led anyone wrong. She defended the crew during its, its greatest um, tragedy. She fought to protect everybody. She was, she, was, she was reprimanded many times for taking too many risks, for taking too much on her own shoulders, for, for leading the way too hard. And we gave her some time off on the ship. We didn't send her down to the planet. And what happened? During her R&R, &R, a slug came in and ate her alive. Was it her fault? No, it wasn't her fault. It was the captain's. Manish Jain. He committed terrible crimes on Earth. He was serving multiple life sentences when he came to join the Vanguard. He was headhunted by the Vanguard committee. Manish had skills. See, he was secretly a real wizard. Uh, not a magician, a real wizard. He could cast actual spells. We sent him to space and he did... He worked miracles. He protected the ship. He fended off the irrigators during the attack with Willow Baker. He could do things that defied reason with his weird, wacky space wizard magic. But none of that amounted to anything because while he was in the bathroom, a slug came and ate him alive. Was it his fault? No, it was the captain's. Jesse Bennett. Everybody thought Jesse Bennett had so much promise. I don't even think I've ever read her back. Jesse left their twin brother behind to join the Vanguard and often wonders if they made the right choice. They didn't. They're quiet, unassuming. They tend to fall in line and follow the strongest personality on the team. But when pushed, they refuse to budge from a stance. Their efforts in collecting and cataloging alien organisms has been invaluable. It was invaluable until one of those alien organisms climbed into her lab and bit her legs off. Was it her fault? No, it was the captain's. Young Zachary Groombridge, clone of the captain. He had all of the, all of the same <laughs> flaws as him. And he tried his darndest to stop the nut crab from climbing into his brain and into the ship and into the bodies of his crew, but he failed much like the captain. Terry Isaac is not dead. He lived just long enough to quit. And he should have, because this ship has a terrible captain. I'm sorry to all the people who've died. <laughs> to Xavier, to Inda, to Valia, to Sophia. To Francisco Potter, who was going to beat cancer but couldn't beat a mountain because the captain ordered her to climb it. To Maximum Polenko, who was living happily in the woods until he was brought onto this ship to be killed pointlessly in the first mission. We say goodbye to Cho Jae Young, who no one even remembers, and Beckman, who created that amazing maneuver, Yut Nimwan, who went on the first mission. 
and the second mission and, and piloted a submarine to the bottom of the ocean and got stuck there and somehow got out and, and yet still died. And what did he die for? Nothing. We say goodbye to Lee Tang, who was just a barista who snuck onto this ship. And what did she get for seeking out the wonders of space? An ignoble death. Joseph Ulrich, one of the first crew members on this ship. We say goodbye to him, to Tane, to the greatest astronaut on the ship who exploded pointlessly. We say goodbye to the kind-hearted hacker and to our tech punk princess and to Charlie Myers who gave his life for nothing in the end, I guess. We say goodbye to Rika de Goff who should have just stayed at home and played Pokemon. We say goodbye to Gong Shun, who had too much riz for this ship, who was just too swaggy and who couldn't live to see such a, such a sad captain. And then there's me. I don't know if I'm gonna get tender my resignation or if all these crew are just going to blow me out an airlock. That's the disappointing end of the ISS Vanguard. The end. The end, everybody. I think, all in all, I enjoyed this game. I was always excited to play this game. And I like this game. I think, for all of the enjoyment I've had, I think I would have preferred a novel. Like, I think the, the thing that's best about this game is its story, or is its lore, is sort of learning about its universe, learning about its mystery. Like, there's a good sci-fi riddle here. I don't know if a board game is the best delivery mechanism for that riddle. You know what I mean? I think I bumped into a lot of little fiddly, fiddly mechanics, uh, unclear sort of dialogue, unclear rules. Um, I think a lot of this game is up to chance, and I think a lot of the fun of it is the fact that random stuff can happen. I don't think this is a game designed for you to to play it like I've played it, right? I'm playing with the, the Deadly Space, the hard rules, which means there's a chance to lose. Or the, I think the way that the game is designed to be played is not with the ultra red, the, the deadly space rules, right? It's, it's designed to be played not with the chance of failure. And I think, I think that makes it a worse game, <laughs> right? I think the most fun I had in this game, and I had a lot of fun, was staving off disaster. And if I was not using the deadly space rules, the hard rules, that would have been trivial. I would have had dozens, I would have dozens of crew right now, right? And yes, it would be sad when they die, right? But this situation, this calamitous situation where a bug just ate everybody, it wouldn't have even been an issue if I, if, if I wasn't using the hard rules, you know what I mean? I think it, the, 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 the challenge is I don't think the game is designed to be using the hard rules, right? So on the one hand, you have a, a situation where I think the game would be a lot less interesting if I wasn't using the hard rules, but the game would, would function better because it's, it's better designed as not having the hard rules. On the other hand, I enjoyed the hard rules a lot and what they added to the game, but the game is obviously not designed for it. Like in this session, I don't, I'm calling it a failure because I think read by the letter of the rules, it is a failure. It's a loss for me. There was no crew and the resting or available crew, period. But there, there's murkiness in the rules there because it's the rules aren't designed to handle these corner cases that come up when you're using the hard version of the rules, the deadly space rules. Um, I think that this game shines the most when it feels like um, Oregon Trail, when it feels a little bit more Oregon Trail-y, right? The chance, again, like, you play Oregon Trail and everyone can die of dysentery five minutes in. You play Oregon Trail, you sometimes get to the end, of, you get to Oregon. Um, when this game feels more like Oregon Trail, it's better. Um, I think the planetary exploration of this game, as much as I, I like chucking dice, 
and I like sort of playing with cards. Not my favorite part of the game. Uh, making cool decisions. Managing my ship, I think, is awesome. The ship book, I think, is great. And sometimes it's a lot of fun to chuck dice and to build a dice pool because you're sort of buying dice. You're sort of picking and choosing cards. You're you're assigning crew members to different sections for their abilities and for their their sort of their little little buffs to dice. I think that's all very cool and neat. It's just not the best part of the game. It doesn't feel like I'm commanding a bunch of crew on, a, on in a, in an away team. It feels like sort of random stuff is happening to them, and either they have the perfect dice and they roll them perfectly and things are easy, or they don't roll perfectly and things go completely against them. They go pear shaped immediately. I think you, if you've watched up to this episode, you've seen all of my complaints, and I think you've seen all of the reasons and things that have excited me. My final verdict on ISS Vanguard: It takes a long time to play. It's expensive, and and it has flaws, right? It has mechanical flaws, it has fictional flaws. But inside this shell of stuff that is inelegant, there is, there is an interesting story. Or, sorry, there's interesting science fiction concepts. And whether there is a story that happens is completely up to you. You have all these little action figures, all these little cards with characters on them, and they will mean as much to you as you invest in them right? I think me talking to you guys in this camera and trying to make predictions and and think about who these people are and how they're responding to what's going on and making choices, not necessarily purely mechanically, but but also um, as, as part of me sort of role-playing with myself with all these, this cast of characters has been the most fun part of it. And as much fun as I've had with that, that's not part of the game, right? That's something I'm bringing to it. So, and I'll, I'll, I really enjoy this game as a vehicle for that. But, yeah, lots of complicated thoughts on this game. I really like it. Um, I don't know. I think it would be a lot better with more people, right? I'd love to play this game with, with uh, two people, Right? I think four people, three or four people, too many. Uh, one person, kind of sad and lonely. Two people, this would be great. The downside is, it's a long game. It's so long. I sat down to play this game today, hours ago. And this was not a very complicated mission until it went pear-shaped. And it still took hours, you know? That's a huge commitment to make with someone. And, like, but if you have someone, and, like... If you have someone who's willing to sit down and to talk about these characters and to make predictions and to to wonder at what the story is going to bring you, I think this could be a great vehicle to to start a conversation that lasts for hours with someone you like talking two, four hours, right? But if you don't have that person and you don't like playing solo, I don't know if this game's for you. It's definitely not made to be played solo. Um, trying to play all four of these characters as a one person is real tough. Trying to play three, real tough. Trying to play two, still tough. Um, trying to manage all of this bookkeeping is kind of nuts. I had a really good time with Vanguard. I had a troubled time with Vanguard. I think this final mission represented both the highs that I've had and the lows that I've had, right? I, I think I've... Uh, all of, the, all, of, all of the things that annoyed me at the beginning of this mission are the things that have annoyed me throughout Vanguard. And all the things that <laughs> made me feel good stuff um, are all the things that have made me feel good stuff throughout Vanguard. I'm, I'm sad that it's over, but it's over. 